This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. Our first program this morning will be a discussion on the evolution of Facebook, one of the um, fastest growing and most disruptive companies on the planet, with the company's 30-year-old, is that true? That's correct. 30-year-old Vice President of Product, Chris Cox. It's a treat to have him here. I don't think he does a lot of uh, public appearances, and we, we managed to get him to join us this morning, so thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Uh, Chris will be interviewed by Atlantic senior editor Alexis Madrigal. You'll see a lot of, it, of Alexis across today. He oversees the Atlantic's technology channel, so if you go to www.theatlantic.com, there's a tech channel, and that is um, run by Alexis. Prior to joining the Atlantic, he was at Wired.com, where he built Wired Science into one of the most popular blogs on the internet. He's also the author of a book called Pioneering the Dream, The History and Promise of Green Technology. And his writing was included in the 2010 anthology, Best Technology Writing. Alexis is also a visiting scholar at the University of Cal California, Berkeley, Office for History and Science and Technology. So he lives up in the Bay Area. And he's co-founded a high-speed media experiment called Longshot Magazine and Haiti Rewired, which is a groundbreaking community dedicated to the discussion of technology, infrastructure, and the future of Haiti. So uh, very accomplished as well. I'll turn things over to Alexis Madrigal and Chris Cox, and thank you again for being here. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, I do think it's actually a, a bit of a treat. I've been covering Facebook for years and years, and you rarely see Chris Cox out here doing his visionary thing, which is what <laughs> we're about to get. Um, so your title is VP of Product, which is one of those sort of suspiciously vague titles. Um, <laughs> what do you actually do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis? So over the last three years, I've built out the product management and the design teams. So each group of people that's building a new feature or product has a bunch of engineers, a product manager, and some designers. And I've been responsible for building out the product management and design functions at Facebook. So just for people who might not think of product the way you do, what is a product on Facebook? The like button is a product. Newsfeed is a product. Um, your timeline is a product that Facebook delivers. And it's a little bit of an interesting twist on a product because uh, a product in a consumer technology, uh, a lot of consumer technology companies would be like a single player game. Um, so you're interacting with a service, the service does stuff in response to you uh, interacting with it, and Facebook's a little bit more of a medium. So the product is more like building a container that moves around ideas and content um, in a way that's predictable and easy to understand. So you've been at Facebook since 2005, right? Yes. So it's been seven years, and you've done a, you've done a bunch of different things. Um, one of the most interesting is you came on as an engineer, but you moved over to human resources at a certain point, right? Yes. Um, so what were you really looking for out of like, Facebook's employees? I mean, you've you're got you know, obviously thousands and thousands of resumes uh, passing in front of you. What was the thing that you were looking for that made them a Facebook employee? Um, we were looking for imaginative people. We were looking for scrappy people. Um, a lot of the folks we were interviewing at the time were coming out of Stanford University, because that's where we were perched. It was right on University Avenue, just two blocks down from Stanford. And we were interviewing a lot of engineers and folks coming out of Stanford. And there were the, some types of people that were super um, sort of academic and super um, sort of slow and meditative in how they approached their daily work. Um, and I was coming from academia as well, and I was one of those people, really. Um, and there was another type of person that was a little bit more experimental and a little bit more 
um, fast moving and fast paced and were really builders at heart. Um, they got their joy out of building and watching people use something and learning how um, they could be better builders and how people could sort of interact in a more um, sort of modern way. And so we were looking for this sort of hacker builder type. So what was the sort of most unusual hiring story? I mean, someone who like hacked Facebook and then you hired them. I mean, I feel like you well, hear Well, that, that happened. Stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, two, two stories came to mind. One was hiring the college professor that taught me how to code. Um, was I walked into an interview and I didn't know actually who I was going into interview and I walked into the room and there was this professor, Jerry Kane, who teaches Stanford students um, a few introductory classes on computer science. And I had been used to going into these interviews and asking people like computer science questions, <laughs> a lot of which came out of the class that Jerry Kane had taught me. And so I walked in and I was like, what do I ask Jerry Kane? What did you ask? Um, I asked him a problem about, um, it was like a graph traversal problem. So graphs, computer scientists used to talk about anything whose fundamental sort of like nature is connectedness. And so I drew a graph on the board and we started talking about graph traversal problems, a lot of which are applicable in social networking. Um, I think but I it would have gone with, why do you story. want to work for Facebook? <laughs> right? I asked yeah. him that as well. Yeah. Um, but we also had some people who were young hackers. There was this one famous story of a kid who created this hack so that when you looked at someone's profile, that your, um, your own profile would turn into a MySpace account. <laughs> um, and this was in 2006. Um, so Facebook was this really small, like blue and white, super spare, college kids only, English only, you know, only available at a few universities, and MySpace was what everybody thought of when they thought of social networking in 2006. And so we kind of defined ourselves in some ways as an antithesis to MySpace because we'd go outside and everybody would say, hey, are you that MySpace for college? And we'd say, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember in those early days, one of my really good friends, this, the Charlie Cheever, came yeah. on uh, to Facebook, and I remember going to stay at his whole of an apartment like near Stanford, yeah. and he was like, I don't know how we're going to catch MySpace. They're just yeah. growing so <laughs> fast, and, like, and then lo and behold, seven years later. Um, in, an, in an alternate universe where, you know, Mark Zuckerberg never starts Facebook, or he goes back to school, or he doesn't get funding, or he gets in a bike accident, and he doesn't decide, you know, he, he, can't, he can't continue. Like, how different do you think the internet would be if Facebook had never existed? I've never gotten that question. <laughs> I imagine it would be probably pretty similar, um, but on maybe a more prolonged time frame. So I tend to think, and I think a lot of us tend to think that a lot of these um, technologies are going to get built at some point in time. It's just a question of when and by whom, and what are the qualities that it has, and when does it come out, and what's the story behind it. Um, I absolutely believe that something like Facebook would exist. I don't know if it would be as big right now, in 2012. Um, Which, a billion users, if you Yeah, we just announced Facebook these. got it to a billion uh, active users which we don't even know how to think about, frankly. Um, so I think you know, Mark is, had an incredibly clear vision for what Facebook could be that developed very, very quickly. And he knew right away that he had gotten this sort of like massive opportunity dropped in his lap. Um, and I think he rallied a bunch of people around that. And we all got very excited about it. And we, we ran forward with it. But, you have to think that something like this would have come about maybe a little bit more slowly. I mean, one of the things that I, I wonder how you guys think about is that you know, sharing of things sort of preceded Facebook. I think a lot of times we think of them as being uh, kind of the same thing. But you know, if we look at our traffic for The Atlantic or other sites that I've worked at, and you look at the, no the amount of people coming out of like emails or like instant messaging, right? people just like talking to each other, it's actually huge. And it still continues to dwarf all social media traffic for us. But what Facebook seems to have done is like structure the way that you share and make it sort of indexable, makes it searchable. Um, how much responsibility, or how do you think about that responsibility in terms of structuring the way that people are giving information to one another? So we talk a lot about Facebook being a medium. And the idea is just that a good medium doesn't interfere with the message. Um, 
it provides a container that's transparent, easy to use, reliable, fast, um, and honors sort of the, the message of the sender. And um, do you think you it's possible to have a medium that doesn't alter the message? No. <laughs> I, I'm a great fan of Marshall McLuhan, and <laughs> he taught us all that there's no such thing as a message without a medium. Um, but when we look at the things that have been successful on Facebook, they have the property of being super lightweight, um, super easy to use, and universal. Um, so if you think about Facebook right now, it's in over 80 languages. It's in right to left languages on a Nokia N60 in the middle of Nairobi. Um, it's on a giant you know, flat screen monitor in somebody's office in Palo Alto. It's on a tablet. It's on a new kind of like Galaxy 4. Mm -hmm. um, it's on all kinds of devices. And it, the medium needs to be something that can work sort of wherever it goes. Um, and so when we look at designing new features for Facebook, we look at things that are as simple to use as speech, um, like commenting or liking or sharing or sending. We don't create new words. We don't create um, like a new name for a product that's just about commenting um, <laughs> or just about messaging. Our messages product is called Messages. Um, <laughs> our newsfeed product is called Newsfeed. Um, and our photos product is called Photos. <laughs> and <laughs> it may sound silly, but you get in these product discussions, and there's, a, there's sort of an inherent bias for a lot of builders to create something that has its own brand. Um, because that's what most consumer products do. And Facebook has really started from the idea that it should be sort of an, like a glass yeah. that's clear and as much as possible um, relays the intention of the sender. I want to talk a little bit about the, the diversity of users that Facebook has now. Has, is anyone in this room, did they get a smartphone before you got a computer? <laughs> So this is like, you're, you, like me, like Chris, like everyone, uh, everyone here, I mean, we're part of Facebook's first sort of few hundred million users, people in the West who had computers. And a computer meant this thing that had like a keyboard and then some way of manipulating this like cursor on the screen. Um, but the last few hundred million users and, you know, presumably their next 500 million or a billion users are going to be people who got a phone before they got a computer. And... Um, these mobile-first users, I mean, how are they different? And, and what have you learned about them sort of watching how they interact with Facebook and each other versus like, you know, people like us? Yeah, I mean, the average new Facebook user is in India or Indonesia or Brazil right now. Um, you know, they're using a mobile phone primarily to access Facebook because they haven't had access to a broadband laptop or PC. Um, and for a l in a lot of cases, there isn't a, an infrastructure of media and communications that you have in the US. So a lot of Americans will meet me and say, oh, Facebook, it's great for gossiping and like seeing what my friends are eating for lunch. Um, but if you were to talk to somebody um, in the Middle East, maybe you'd hear a different story, which is that Facebook was providing access to um, news to people that had um, unique access to information that they weren't able to get at otherwise. And you get a much more sort of meaty um, story about what Facebook means to them. And that's awesome. Right. Um, but do you notice things that they actually behave differently with the system? Like they share more pictures versus text. They share less links because, I mean, or are they basically everyone interacts with Facebook the same way? So one interesting thing is cameras, right? So a lot of people getting a, a smartphone for the first time will also have gotten their first camera, um, which is something interesting to think about. If we're about to have 4 billion smartphones in 2017, that means 4 billion people may have access to a video camera, a GPS device, a gyroscope, an 8 megapixel photographic lens, a high bandwidth internet connection, a glowing touch screen that's like a thousand times more powerful than whatever sent us to space in 1969 in your pocket, hopefully for a very, very cheap price. Um, and we look at that and we say, geez, all these people are going to have video cameras and cameras in their pockets, and they're going to be able to take, have a lens into the world that they can share with all of us. Um, and so we look at phones as being not just consumption devices, but also uh, publishing tools. And that's actually a really, really exciting way to think about the adoption of mobile phones. Yeah. Do you think that 
these people, who are just going to be like billions of people in the world, are going to be mobile first, or do you think they're going to be mobile only? I mean, that is to say, a lot of the reason people are using phones first is that they're inexpensive relative to a computer. And do you think they're going to transition over? I mean, I actually think they are, but uh, I feel like I'm in the minority on this. Yeah, I think a lot of people are going to be mobile only just because of the geography and the, the sort of the data available where they are. Yeah. Um, I don't think PCs are going to go away. I don't think tablets are going to go away. I think there's still going to be, I think most of us probably believe you're going to have moments at your breakfast table or your couch um, or your desk at work where you're going to be sitting down and computing and you're going to want a big screen. And there's just no way around that. <laughs> I just want the keyboard, right? I mean, for me, it's the keyboard. So, you know, as we, as we talk about this group of people and this sort of rapidly expanding user base, a billion people, do you think Facebook should have a, some sort of elected body that helps govern the site out of the users as opposed to just like sort of within the product team? So we do take a lot of feedback and we do have a vote that um, goes into effect every time we release a new um, terms of service. So we did um, go out of our way early on to try and involve the user base in sort of evaluating, giving feedback on, and then approving um, sort of the release of new terms of service. Um, we decided not to have votes on new features um, very, very early on, and we did talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, because we basically observed that if we looked at the features people were asking for in 2005, it was, I want to see who's looked at my profile. <laughs> um, I, and I want music yeah. playing when someone shows up at my profile. And I want to be able to decorate my wallpaper. And we looked at those and we said, you know, those are reasonable features, but if you looked at the way people were behaving, you actually saw a much more interesting ask, um, which was, I want to see what's going on with the people around me because every day I log in and I go and I click on all of my friends to see if anything's changed. Mm -hmm. And so we tend to use a little bit more of a behavioral analysis when trying to determine what products would be successful rather than a vote, um, which doesn't tend to produce always the best results. But what about elected representatives? I mean, it's interesting because Facebook, uh, as a, as a, its messaging is that, hey, this is like the world's largest agglomeration of people. It's bigger than whole countries and these things. But countries yeah. have like, at least some of them, have like elected bodies of, of people, right? Because I, it's sort of direct democracy with a billion people seems difficult. But elected representatives, something that gives uh, the users like a, a vote. Yeah, it's a really interesting idea. Yeah. <laughs> I think that means no. Um, so <laughs> if you go back now and you look at what Mark Zuckerberg was saying, say, five years ago, um, he was like, pretty open with the idea that he essentially wanted everyone in the world to be on Facebook. Um, but no one, I think, quite took it that seriously. Maybe his investors did, but I don't think most people uh, saw that um, ambition as something that was going to happen. So what's the thing that now you guys are just completely open about the ambition, but if it actually happens in three years or in two years or in five years, we're all going to be like, whoa, where'd that come from? Huh. So one thing Mark has talked a lot about, and I think we spend a lot of time on in the company, is the idea of different categories being transformed into... Uh, to being influenced by social media. Um, and you're starting to see that with news. Um, you're starting to see more and more of the, um, the way that people discover and consume news coming from social media. It's happening slowly, but it is happening. How many people here get their news from social media? Or at least some, some set of it. I mean, I do. Probably, yeah. And if you probably read any of my work, you kind of get your news from social media because I get mine from social media. <laughs> <laughs> But if you think about what's happening on the internet in categories, there's games, there's e-commerce, there's travel, there's shopping. Um, you know, these are all um, right now sort of one-player games. Um, if you think about your going and deciding where you're going to stay on a trip to Bangkok, you're largely interacting with a collection of documents written by relatively anonymous people and then the averaged opinion of a bunch of strangers. And that's the same is true of finding a pair of jeans. Um, the shame is, same is true of deciding where to eat most of the time. And the same is true of a lot of decisions that you make when you're online. Um, and we all see that the way the world is going, we're going to be making more and more in, of those decisions with a computer in front of us, whether it's where to eat or which hotel to stay at, um, maybe one day who to vote for on Proposition 21. And 
we look at that as an opportunity to turn it into like a multiplayer experience. And not just Facebook, but the whole ecosystem of social media and developers. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine that um, the travel experience of designing a trip to Bangkok as being one that's influenced by where your friends have stayed. I bet a bunch of you guys have been to Thailand. I bet you have do's and don'ts. I bet you have a really great place you had Pad Thai. I bet there was a beach you thought was beautiful and a temple you would have avoided because the line was long um, and a particular piece of advice you might have for a traveler. All of that stuff is real. And if you had a phone with you the next time you were there and you could just press a button and leave a little trail there. Um, and then when you showed up, you could see that this was what people had done and interacted with there. That starts to be a really, really compelling way of thinking about how computers can start to be more of a conduit of the lenses of your friends and the people you trust and um, anybody in the world rather than just like uh, an internet connection with a screen on top of it. So one of the presuppositions of that vision is just that you need a persistent identity that's attached to like every person in your life that sort of has a memory, right? You need this thing has to be searchable and has to like sort of be in place over all the times and all the trips and all the things. I mean, do you see that as sort of a novel view of identity or do you think that you're just replicating something that's occurring in the, in the real world? So phones are something that you have with you all the time and are persistent and, and in a lot of ways the whole vision of digital identity, the answer to a lot of it is a phone. Because you only have one, you don't share it with people. You know, you're mm -hmm. probably mm -hmm. the only person that uses your phone unless you're showing someone a photograph. And it contains all of this information, it contains your contacts, it contains the applications you use and all that other stuff. Um, and Facebook, we really think about it as an opportunity to connect if you're going to have a phone and a tablet and a TV and a PC, and you're going to have hundreds of applications on all of them, and they're all going to have lots of content behind them. Facebook, we've always thought about as being this connective tissue that lets you sort of transport um, that this is my friend or that I really like this person's music or that this is a restaurant I go to all the time and sort of transport that across the different applications you use, across the different operating systems you use to provide a continuous experience on your behalf. With the caveat that if you want to log out, you always can. <laughs> right, 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 right. But I, I think you know one of the concerns that I hear most from people is just like that their kids are doing things on Facebook now that are going to be attached to them over the long haul. But that you know in the in the past, you know, you're 19 years old, you're in college, you know, maybe there's a couple of you know uh, Polaroids floating around you wouldn't necessarily want people to see. But by and large, that like you're able to move on from that period of your life. Totally. Um, is there some sense that you could build for getting into Facebook? Yeah, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, and from the very beginning, we've built tools. I mean, the whole vision was that you could add or remove anything. You could change the privacy of anything. And that each person was in control of the representation that they put on their profile. And so from the very, very beginning, people don't often remember that one of the unique things about Facebook when it was created was privacy controls so that you could say, these are the people that can see this thing, these are the people that can see this thing, and that was only possible if you had a system that knew who each person was. Um, that and you know, always reminding people that you can remove stuff <laughs> that you've <laughs> right. posted, and you can change the privacy on stuff in a really nice container where you can go sort of amend the way that you're presented on your profile. But you can't remove stuff other people have posted. That's right. true, although that's true of the internet. right? Um, and what Facebook has provided is a, is a set of tools that let people remediate. Yeah. So um, Actually, this is really interesting. Can you, uh, there's, so Facebook has all these ways. Imagine there's a billion people, and they're coming into conflict all the time, both in ways big and small, right? On the small side, it's like someone posted an ugly picture of you, and you'd like them to take it down. And on like, the big side, there's like hazing or bullying. I mean, imagine, take a middle school and like, put it online, right? And like, all the things that happen in middle school, they're happening online, too. Um, and so Facebook has designed a set of tools that are essentially like a billion person conflict resolution machine that both reduces the customer service work that they have to do in terms of like adjudicating disputes, but it also has all of these other features in terms of guiding people back 
to the person who they're having a dispute with. And so maybe you could just describe. Like, yeah, I mean, it's incredible. Results. We used to get all these emails. And from give them some numbers, too, because I think <laughs> the scale of it is like ridiculous. Yeah, so there's several billion photos uploaded to Facebook a week. Um, and if you just think about a billion photographs um, compared to the amount of photographs that existed on Earth um, in the 80s or something like that, we're literally just like dumping massive amounts of published content onto the internet every day. And it's also cool because the internet in the 90s, when we were all trying to imagine the internet, it was like these web pages, and they would sort of like a new web page would get created, and every day a few hundred or a few thousand web pages would get added. But now it's sort of like been exploded. If you think about Instagram and Pinterest and Twitter and Facebook and the whole ecosystem of, of services now where literally hundreds of millions of people a day are writing the internet. It's not like thousands of people are creating it and the rest of us are just kind of checking it out, which is the world we grew up in. But it's now like literally these tiny little bits of content that every one of us is creating and contributing, which is a really cool idea. Um, photos, it turns out, can be controversial. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what we learned early on was that a lot of people would write us, Facebook, in Palo Alto, write us a letter. Dear Facebook. Dear Facebook. I don't like this photo <laughs> of me uh, because I look kind of chubby in it. And we would get lots and lots and lots of these emails every day. Well, in fairness, it was a pretty bad picture. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we responded to you <laughs> right away. Um, and we learned that the, the tool, when you clicked report a photo, we offer these tools like you can report any piece of content. We learned that it wasn't supporting the different cases that people actually had. And the real problem here was this is embarrassing. It wasn't this is illegal, or this is misleading, or this is, uh, there's something that says this shouldn't be online. It was just this is embarrassing. And the more we crafted the language, we actually worked with a, a group at the University of Berkeley that studies the language of compassion to come up with the best tools for helping people remediate a problem and actually direct their message to the person who posted the photo. Makes sense. And what started happening is this really cool um, thing, which is people started resolving their problems together, which is also great because then the publisher gets the feedback. You know, it would be one thing if we get an email and we can't tell the person who created the photo to begin with, you know what, you should think a little bit more about this. Um, but we were able to sort of build a, uh, a set of tools so that people could resolve these things quickly at scale, um, which made us able to not have to hire millions of people to read emails, <laughs> right. which was nice. Um, but, but I mean, this is literally at the scale of like, you're getting like tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands kind of movements like this. I, I don't even know the number, yeah. but I'm sure it's on that order. Yeah, yeah. They even have, um, not, not to be a Facebook ad here, but I actually think this is smart. Um, they even have particular tools for helping people report when they think their friends are feeling suicidal, right? Because people, oddly enough, uh, oftentimes now when they're feeling suicidal, say online, I'm actually feeling really down and kind of suicidal. And so let's say you see that, like how do you deal with that as a friend of someone who's, who's seeing these things, right? And so they actually, they worked with a bunch of outside groups to like, sort of develop a process for these things. And now, like when you really think about it, it's gonna be thousands of people are gonna get help that way just because of the scale of the, of the thing. Um, so that I'm really interested in is sort of like Facebook as an American company um, because it's, you know, now uh, Americans are a small percentage of the user base. But do you feel like there are some set of American values that are like embedded into the product? Like the, the mission of the company, right, is like a more open world which it sounds like suspiciously American free speechy. You know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, to the extent that free speech is American, um, which you could argue And about. like our version <laughs> of free speech, right? I mean... Yeah, I mean, the, the thesis of Facebook, or one of the theses, is that you should be able to put a message in a, in a container and send it to whomever you want. And that is something that you should have the ability to do um, unfettered. And that's something that communication technology has made faster, easier, and cheaper uh, since the beginning of time. And one way of looking at Facebook is just like one more step in the process of making communication from what's in your head to what's in mine, wherever we are, um, for free and high resolution um, quickly. Um, that's what Facebook's doing. Um, 
But you know, we really do view ourselves at the highest level as an international company, mostly because our users are international, the product is international, we've built tools so that it can be translated by a locale into their native language. So Facebook is available in Basque. Um, Facebook is available in a lot of different island languages that most of the internet isn't available to because we're not paying translators to come into Menlo Park and like learn how the product works and then decide how you should say the word like in German. Or worse, unlike, which is not a real word. Um, and the process of translating and localizing into all these different places and then arriving in an airport in Sri Lanka and seeing people use Facebook um, is one that we've all gone through and, and one that we deal with the gravity of. As this is a tool that's gone above and beyond the United States. Um, and that's something we should be supportive of and excited about. You, one of the most interesting features of Facebook, I mean, right, Twitter works like everything goes out there, right? And it's just like a reverse chronological stream, right? I mean, it's just everything that people post, it's there, and that's what your feed looks like. But Facebook has a set of filters that sort of stand between you and like all these people. So maybe you can describe like how that set of filters works in insofar as you can. Yeah. So the basic problem is there's more and more content created every day by the people around you. That's growing really, really quickly because we have cameras and there's like buttons and we're sharing more and more stuff. And people are connecting to more than just their friends now on Facebook. They're also connecting to Mitt Romney and Alicia Keys and the local barber and all these other individuals, each of whom has a channel is one way of thinking about it. And one way of imagining the problem is that each person has all of these channels that are publishing stuff every day and they have some fixed amount of time. Maybe it's a minute, maybe it's five minutes, maybe it's 25 minutes. Maybe they're on an iPhone, maybe they're on a tablet, maybe they're on a PC. But in that amount of time, you want to give each person the absolute best possible um, handful of pieces of content um, for them at that time. And that's a growing problem. It's actually growing very, very quickly, and we believe very, very important to solve. And what um, there's a bunch of machine learning, there's a bunch of uh, infrastructure to sort of assemble for each person. I mean, one way of thinking about it is you're publishing for each of a billion people a personalized newspaper that's alive um, every minute. And it just needs to sort of stay up to date. Um, and there's all this infrastructure for storing the activity, and then there's a model that basically tries to predict what um, it's most likely to get interacted with. And the thing that Newsfeed is optimizing for is what people will interact with. What will they like? What will they comment on? And what will create a connection between the publisher and the consumer? And there's a lot of details in how all that right, stuff works, right. which I'm sure you guys would not want to get into, but that's the high level. Or do you, you know, because if you think about how that system works, right, it's like, it's positive feedback. Like, essentially, you're, you're saying, once you like something, you're going to get more of that thing, which then you might like more of that, and then you're going to get more of that thing. How do you tweak the algorithm so that people don't just sort of spiral down into only a, a, a small set of things? Because if it is a personalized newspaper, um, how do you sort of maintain balance between you know, things you know people might interact with and their sort of aspirational idea of what they'd like to interact with, right? Like, there's the, there's the Huffington Post gallery, and then there's the long form James Fallows, yeah. right? And people want to have both interact with one more often, but they aspirationally want to see the other one and, and check it out occasionally. Totally. I mean, the main thing we rely on there is people. Um, one of your friends probably posts the James Fallows article. And some of your All friends, of my probably friends I think, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, for an average person, just like in their real social life, there are people that are um, you know, posting articles about a particular thing. There are people that are super noisy. There are people that don't speak very often, but when they do, it's very, very deep. Um, there are people that are domain experts in particular things. There are people that share a lot of music. There are people that share a lot of news. There are people that only share photos of their children. <laughs> Um, or the cat in my case. And one of yeah, and one of the primary things that um, we try and do with Newsfeed is preserve a balance of which people you're seeing, so that you're not just seeing one person or you're not just seeing one type of thing. Um, and that goes along with what people tend to enjoy and interact with more is just things that tend to be balanced. And so there's a little bit of a diversity and a little bit of a of a coin flip. That what goes does it in feel like well. to sit at the controls though? knowing that you're going to like tweak some setting and suddenly like everybody is going to see a different subset of their friends. 
I mean, do you feel that weight of responsibility? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's an incredible responsibility. It's humbling. Um, but it's something that's also exciting to do because from the very early days when we first launched Newsfeed, I mean, it was the first product I worked on. I spent nine months with a team working on Newsfeed. We launched it, and people hated it. Nobody liked it. It was like literally, imagine spending 10 months in like a secret, like, you know, <laughs> startup. You're working on something. Your friends are asking you, what are you working on? I can't tell you. Um, but you'll know it when you see it, is what I would say. And they're like, oh, that thing I hated? Y yeah. <laughs> I knew that was you. And we launched it. <laughs> and my inbox was full with all these people I went to high school with that I literally hadn't heard from in like six years. <laughs> hey, Chris. Heard you're at Facebook now. What did you do to my homepage? <laughs> <laughs> and we waited for the uh, positive emails to come in, and I think I got one from my mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, seriously, it was heavy. Yeah. And um, so we tried to understand what was going on, and we read all the emails, obviously, and we talked to everybody, obviously. Um, I mean, you ask how it feels, that's how it feels. Right, it's right. like you walk outside the door and everybody, it's not just this big number out there. It's also knowing that everybody in your life is relying on this thing yeah. um, to get some value out of and to see what's going on. So how did time. you stick with that then, knowing that most people would have said, oh, this thing failed, let's pull it? Well, the main thing was we believed in it. I mean, we really believed that there was something that could be built that provided this conduit from each person to their friends that was just as easy as pulling a phone out of your pocket. Um, so we did believe in a deep way in the vision of what Newsfeed could be. And the other thing was that when we watched people use it, not what they so told us, but when we watched people use it, people were really, really, really using it a lot. There was a ton of engagement. It was growing. Um, and then within like two or three weeks, the emails were gone. And nobody was emailing anymore. And then it was about a year or two later, we started reading headlines like, you know, newsfeed, you know. The greatest thing. Yeah, like, <laughs> these guys were really visionary. Um, and it was nice to finally, you know, have a couple other people say, hey, this is actually pretty cool. Um, what do you think turned the tide? People using it and getting value out of it. I mean, it's the same with any new technology. I mean, you go back and you look at the first radio or the first time we talked about the telephone and everybody said, this is going to invade our privacy to put telephone lines in our houses. Uh, because now people will call and they'll know when I'm not home and they'll go break into my house. Um, and that's probably happened a few times, but on balance, telephones are probably good. <laughs> <laughs> um, caller ID. Massive freak out when caller ID came out, all the way at the governmental level. Oh my God, caller ID, now you're going to know who's calling you. <laughs> um, this is an invasion of privacy. And now if you see the anonymous on your phone, you're not going to pick right, up the yeah. phone. Right, right, right. right. God, and I, I think we something. have, you know, <laughs> you look at uh, the net in 1994. That was how we you know, told people this is what the internet is. Sandra Bullock wakes up one morning. She types her name into the internet and hits enter. <laughs> she goes to bed, and she wakes up. Her children are gone. Her bank accounts are gone. She like, can't do anything. She's completely lost all of her bearings in society. And we were given the message that this is what happens when you sort of like use the internet. Um, and I think it's just proof that we're not very good at understanding when it comes along um, what's going to be sort of imminently valuable, and what is just our reaction to something that's different from the world we're used to living in. Yeah. Um, and that's the big takeaway for me. Okay. Let's uh, open it up to questions. We have about 14 minutes. Um, let's go there, and then we'll go there. And there's a mic coming to you, so right there. Yeah. My question is pertaining to the impact of Facebook on democracy throughout the world. You um, touched upon it. But where I become more concerned is vis-a-vis -vis the fact that rogue governments and dictatorships, from what I've read in the newspaper, are able to shut down internet sources, including Facebook. And I'm just wondering, do you have like spies, I put it in quotes, in different parts of the world um, who help keep Facebook 
up and running or am I just in a whole other way of thinking about it? I'm just trying to figure out how Facebook can continue to be effective in countries that are um, closed uh, with their communications. So we don't have spies that I know of. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a spy. All right. um, we but do if you did, you couldn't tell us about it <laughs> anyway. So. We do spend a ton of time and energy on making sure Facebook is available quickly in every part of the world where it's used. So we're, um, we spend a ton of time on spreading the infrastructure out over the world and on hiring people that know how to make sure that over that last mile into the outskirts of Hyderabad, you can get the newsfeed. Um, when it comes to, to governments that shut the internet off, there's not a whole lot we can do. Um, although it's interesting that young people, um, I had a friend, Jared Cohen, who spent a bunch of time in Iran, just watching young people use technology. And one of the things he observed was that, um, I think the way he put it to me was the average 18 year old in Iran knows every last detail of how Bluetooth works on their phone, of all of the ins and outs of Facebook, all of the ins and outs of Twitter, you know, exactly how to change your, you know, this setting so that this person can message you, like every last detail of the technology they understood. And when he asked them, are you afraid of, you know, the government finding it, they would say, oh no, they don't understand how this stuff works. <laughs> um, and it was a message to me that w in these places where people really do need an outlet or a way of communicating that's not necessarily available in the public domain, um, it's a completely different animal. Yeah, it's interesting too. I mean, we, we've written a little bit about this um, issue, particularly on the security side. I mean, like one of the worst things that's happened, not just to Facebook, but to other places that people go to log in and essentially the government runs, puts like a little middleware piece in between the person typing and the actual yeah. website. And that kind of thing allows them to capture their password and then they can go in and infiltrate these networks. And so the good thing is that companies like Facebook, Google, like any place where you're logging in, if you do that, that's con you're breaking their service. And so they have a lot of resources behind stopping that from happening. And so you know how um, oftentimes in your browser, it used to be like HTTP, right? And now it says a lot of the time HTTPS. So a lot of that has to do with sort of increasing the security, not just for uh, people, you know, who are who are battling, you know, mean governments, but also, you know, for helping you out and battling normal hackers. <laughs> um, although one thing I'll note about hackers is like, you know, the biggest breaches have tended to be there was actually a pizza place near my hometown in Vancouver, Washington, that stored everybody's credit cards like sitting on a box. Uh, who had ever <laughs> ordered a pizza from that place. And a bunch of hackers got into it, and it was like 50,000 credit cards go down, right? And then that has happened many, many times, multiplied out by all of these sort of legacy systems. It actually tends to be the old stuff, not the new stuff that's been really bad in terms of crucial data. Yep, right there. Uh, Dave Proffer. I was curious uh, around this concept, if you had a discussion around the innocence of the Muslim video that came out on YouTube about, about did you have any kind of you know, conversation if that had happened in a Facebook context and putting that out and, and then do you think about this supra country kind of aspect that you guys are providing and what the effects are going to be and what the short term things are, you know, compared to Salman Rushdie before and what's happening now? Yeah, it's, it's really hard to think about that stuff. I mean, I, I think of that video mostly as a product of the internet and the freely available access to tools um, and the distribution of those videos. That could have happened on Facebook or anywhere. I actually think of that video largely, I mean, I feel like we don't know the whole story of what was going on with that, but I just, the fact that it, that it, I don't think it was a spontaneous thing. I mean, I think you had that video get translated and move within these social circles. Uh, in, in that world, but it wasn't, I actually don't even blame the internet for it. I mean, I think you could have had that thing on a VHS tape or played over like a regular news station and it would have had a similar effect. Right there. Yes, I, my name is Karen Jagoda. I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about monetizing Facebook. You said it was free, but uh, a billion people, that represents a lot of uh, disposable income. So uh, promoted uh, Facebook posts or advertising on Facebook, could you say a little bit more about where that's going? Sure. So the primary way Facebook thinks about monetizing is advertising. Um, and that's because we want to be able to provide a free service. A billion people represents a lot of cost. 
um, <laughs> to keep everything up and running. And advertising is the natural business model for a content distribution company. I mean, it's been the business model for basically every medium. Um, you have content, and then in the middle of the content, um, an advertiser can pay to promote whatever it is that they, whatever the message is that they want to send. So at the very, very highest level, we think Facebook can be um, one solution for better advertising in the future. Um, just because it will be easier for the ads that you care about to reach you um, than mediums that don't have any idea who you are. There's also some interesting takes on how people are going to monetize through Facebook, like the BuzzFeed model, where essentially the media companies are like, we know how to make content people want to share with each other, which will then like, go to lots of people we'll see. And so they've started to create those ads specifically for their spreadability, which is pretty interesting. Um, I'm going to go right here, and then we'll go in the back after that. Oh, right. Thank you. My hand signals are ambiguous. My apologies. <laughs> Hi, Nancy Sintelwise. Uh, just curious about the thought processes that go into coming up with the next evolution of Facebook. Like, it took you nine months or ten months, almost, almost a gestation's worth, to come up with the news feed. And how many people? <laughs> how, how many Never people? Thought of it that way how many brains? <laughs> I'm sorry? I said I've never thought of it uh, that yeah, way, well, but you're right. I'm a, I, I'm a gynecologist and OBGYN by background, so I think, <laughs> so I think, I think like that. <laughs> and then you gave birth and no one liked the baby. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I know. It was an ugly baby. Yeah, right. But after a while, you know, parents do get used to their kids and enjoy them. But <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly I understand this yeah, for the first right. time. <laughs> So, so moving on from that, pro th that pr thought pro what goes into making the next evolution? How many brains go into it? And then when you, when you think far advance, uh, do you take in outsider's considerations? For example, I'm thinking of an entire generation of kids whose parents probably think they waste more time than anything else on Facebook. Is there, is there any way of thinking about, let's say, integrating Facebook into educational systems where school systems actually encourage kids to Facebook with each other, maybe in a creative way, maybe making little microcosms of Facebook within the school systems or something that may have a more, quote, positive, productive outcome from an educational point of view? Yeah. We would love that. I think the schools would probably be the hard part there, <laughs> um, pitching schools to use Facebook at school. Well, well what kind of um, communication do you have in, in this way if you say you love that? So where would you go with that? Well, right now we've launched a, a sort of a nascent uh, product called Communities that lets universities sort of take Facebook and kind of make sure that only students at that university can use that group. So it's sort of like a mega group that allows um, Cornell University to have the Cornell, the different classes and courses from Cornell. Because when we started using Facebook, it was in a university, and a lot of what was useful about Facebook was finding so people in your, your class. anthropology class. Yeah. It turns out that was really hard in 2003 to find someone in your anthropology class who lived near you that you could study with. And that little bit of value and multiplied by a billion ends up being a lot because it turns out so much of the learning process is finding people to learn with. Um, and so we, we do things that are sort of broadly useful like that and can be launched and sort of have like a girder of utility like only Cornell students could use this and now you can create subgroups in Cornell for your soccer team and your anthropology class and your English teacher lecture or whatever. And then we'll keep looking into things like I, that. You know, I think the other answer to that question is also that they have an ecosystem right, of companies that uh, are building on top of Facebook. And it seems to me, at least, that education is one that looks more likely to be solved by an outside company that takes all that infrastructure and does something interesting with it. Um, last question right there in the back, gentlemen. Hi, Chris. Stacy Kremitis. Uh, with respect to Instagram, what do you envision to be the business and social possibilities f for Facebook users using Instagram, and how does that compare with the vision that Pinterest has for itself? So Instagram, we just saw as being a total complement for Facebook, because it was already using the Facebook platform, by which it meant you could take your Instagram photo, put a filter on it, and then put it in your friend's newsfeed. And the utility of Instagram was so tied up in the utility of what Facebook was doing, we just thought it was a natural fit to work together. It's also the case we went to school with those guys. We knew them very, very well. They loved Facebook. 
Um, so we liked each other. We had a very similar view for what would happen in the world, and they were growing like crazy and, and just a remarkably engaging product. I mean, you see Instagram's numbers, they're insane. Um, Pinterest is um, built using a lot of the tools that Facebook offers. So when you pin something to the shoes I love board, you can share that with your friends and newsfeed, and you can put it on your timeline. If you're a shoe collector, you can have these like grids of shoes that you've collected over time on Pinterest. And we see them as just an awesome partner. Um, going into the future, there's probably going to be a bunch of things like that. And the best we can do is provide a, a world where, as a Pinterest user, you get to do exactly what you want on Pinterest. And then Facebook is, to the extent you want to share it, or spread it to people, or collect it on your timeline, you can do that there. All right, Chris, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't wrap up. But first, <laughs> um, can you tell us one thing about Mark Zuckerberg that we don't know that is interesting? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Just one, you know, we already heard he wears the same clothes every day. Um, Mark and I's dogs play together. <laughs> Mark has this really cute dog named Beast. <laughs> and um, we have this really cute dog named Snoop. And Snoop's a little Staffordshire pit. And Beast is a, uh, what's he? A, a poolie. He's like a little poolie. So whose dog is the top? dog in this I think scenario. Beast probably <laughs> is. Um, Beast is very like alpha, but he's really, really cute, and he's really, really adorable. And one of the things you may not know about Mark is he is an avid dog owner and dog lover. Fair enough. Cool. <laughs> Chris Cox, thank, thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs>